ambition of transition is really big. Transition says, how can we change our food system, our energy generation system? The crux of what we do is that we grow gourmet oyster mushrooms from waste coffee grounds. It's a genuine local store of money directing it to people in Bristol that really need it the most. I started thinking about cooperatives and whether collectively we could have a system where people could invest small amounts individually. Our idea was that what we were creating was a, a detox for the West. Our business is for the community, um, it's not for profit at all, it's a social enterprise. Money at the end of the day is a, a social relation. If we could shift 10% of what we spend on food as a community to supporting local food, that's £2 million in our economy every year. That's economic development. The guy proposing it called Nick Goodroom, he went and scratched his head a little bit and came back with this idea of a no-dig market garden. Actually what the developing world needs is alternatives to development. Really what it comes down to is trust. We started doing transition imagining it was a, an ecological process, an environmental process, an economic process, but now we really see it as being a cultural process. There's a real sense that we're working together to try and transform things in Bristol and that feels really inspiring. Well, hello, I'm Judy Richardson. I work at Schumacher College on the Economics for Transition programme there. And I hope you've enjoyed that amazing set of clips and found those projects inspiring. They're all examples of transition in action here across the southwest of England. During this movie, we're going to look at how the new economy is coming into being in this area of the world. So we're going to look at how Transition Town Totnes started and the sorts of uh, projects that are now getting off the ground in the food and energy and finance sectors. Then we're going to scale up and look at what transition looks like at the city level uh, using Bristol as a case study. Then we're going to say, well, what does uh, transition look like at the national level and looking at how transition is beginning to influence national policy in the UK. And then how transition is in fact growing across the world, not just in northern countries, but in southern countries. New transition initiatives are starting all the time and regional and national hubs are developing. Here's Rob Hopkins to tell you more about how transition started here. Transition Town Totnes started as a question. We said, what would it look like if, if we all came together and, and did something about this? We don't need anyone to give us permission we could just get started. So in 2005 to 2006, we just showed films about peak oil and climate change. And after a while, people started to stop us in the street and say, yeah, OK, we understand the peak oil thing now. We get the peak oil thing. What next? So projects started very quickly. People were, were excited. They were inspired. They wanted to do things. In uh, September 2006, we held a big event that was the launch event to kick the whole thing off. We had about 400 people, 450 people came to this event and we just invited them to be part of a process. We started to set up groups, working groups. We had a food group, we had an energy group, we had a housing group, we had an education group and these groups started doing different projects and food was the thing that got started first and you see in transition groups around the world the food projects get started first. School Farm is a brilliant project because it reflects both um, a low carbon food growing business as well as operating as a, a training ground for new students in sustainable horticulture. A number of these horticultural students from Schumacher College went on to develop School Farm into a community supported agriculture enterprise. And here's Hal and Laura to tell you what that looks like in practice. In the 60s, it's probably in its peak here, 60s and 70s, doing horticulture education. And then in the 1980s, this place kind of um, fell into disuse. This field was completely overrun with perennial weeds and very much they'd been written off, I would say, by Dartington Hall Trust that managed their properties to generate income. They weren't really expecting much income for this. And we looked at that for great, perfect conditions for regeneration. It was a space to support land-based sustainable projects. And now it's really uh, thriving as a, as a CSA that's a really a key part of the community. I mean, the first thing was to get this, um, the horticultural base going again. And there was a proposal to get a, a market garden going. And the feeling was we wanted something a little bit more ambitious. And so um, the guy proposing it called Nick Goodroom, he went and scratched his head a little bit and came back with this idea of a no-dig market garden. 
turning the soil, you're releasing a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. Basically, you're losing a lot of the quality of the soil in terms of conditions for growing. Um, and so it's easy to see why if you're ploughing regularly, you get into the trap of needing to use lots of artificial inputs, fertilizers and whatnot. Yeah, so this is very much not, never turning the soil. It's actually adding organic matter on top, on top, on top. Um, a lot of weeding, um, low mechanization. So there's, there's not much machinery goes up here. You have a little feel of the soil below you. This is by a gateway and there's still a little bit of bounce in the soil here. If you go by gateway on any conventional farm, it will be like concrete because of all the machinery running over it. Once things start to happen here, we were approached by a college called Dutchie College. They said, wow, you've got so much going on here. Now we could run horticulture education here. So students could learn here. They could learn the garden around the back of Schumacher College and they could learn at the heritage gardens that surround Startington Hall at the top. Um, and once that started to happen, then there was sort of an income for the place. Um, and basically everyone who's working here now has almost, without exception, has been through that course, which is Q Laura. The college courses that were run with Schumacher and Dutchie College brought this whole farm to life. It has four different businesses running on this small site. So we have a flower project, salads and nursery plants. We have an orchard, and then we also have a CSA, the Community Supported Agriculture Project, which is run by four directors, so four women, and we all take part of our livelihood um, from the farm and the community um, including transition town Totnes said we'd really like to see a community supported agriculture we always produce more in case there's problems and then if we produce more and we have much more harvest that year we can sell it to the local shops we have sold to Riverford farm shop at Staverton otherwise for the most part we sell into green life which is an ethical small supermarket um, in the center of Totnes. Our business is for the community. Um, it's not for profit at all. It's a social enterprise. Our income comes, one third comes from our CSA members. One third comes from teaching on college courses through Schumacher and through um, Bicton College. Um, and also we run our own no dig beginners gardening course. And then one third of our income at the moment is through grants. We're still working on the business plan and how we can create a farm that will carry through into the future and just keep going no matter what happens and be resilient. So School Farm was one of the first projects to get going in, in this area on the Dartington estate. And since then, a number of other projects, a whole cluster actually, in fact, a cluster of projects have evolved and they're all linked in some way. For example, the flowers at School Farm, um, are used by or bought by the Green Funeral Company, which is one of the new businesses there. There's also Grow Cycle, which is about um, growing mushrooms based on waste and particularly from coffee grounds. As well as those two businesses, there's the uh, Tanner Bates, who's the traditional leather worker. And together they create a whole cluster of businesses. They, they share resources, they work together. One, one activity feeds in uh, to provide a resource input into another activity. So it's what I would call creating an industrial ecology or a circular economy. And the beginnings of that are, are beginning to start uh, with school, school farm being at the centre of it. So here's um, Adam who's going to talk to us a little bit about what's happening at Grow Cycle. We run a business here called Grow Cycle. The crux of what we do is that we grow gourmet oyster mushrooms from waste coffee grounds. So inside each one of these boxes, there's the waste of about 100 cups of coffee. What happens here is, is mainly a bit of spawn production and, and the grow kits. The site in Exeter is much bigger and in some ways a bit more interesting. There's more happening, but you'll get a sense of it just from looking inside here. So you notice when you come inside that it's really warm um, and normally the lights are off and it's dark. And that's just the ideal conditions for the, the mushroom spawn to start growing. Um, you can see various different stages of growth here. So for example, here's one of the grow kits after about a week or so of, of being made. So you can still see there's quite a lot of, you can see the actual coffee there, can't you? It's kind of, you know, still quite dark. Just a week later and you'll see that it's completely white like that. And that's uh, the, the mushroom spawn is taking over the coffee, feeding off of it. It's full of nutrients still and it's using that as its food source another week or so's time and you can cut that bag open and it will start to produce mushrooms. And all of this really just serves to highlight the role that fungi play in nature which is to recycle nutrients back into the, the food chain and really we're just utilising millions of years of, of evolution but we're applying it to, to 
you know, very large waste streams. OK, so you've just heard about two really exciting food projects that are ho happening in the local area. Um, well, Totnes isn't just focusing on food. There's also some really exciting finance and economic projects that are going. And one of those first projects that started up was actually the Totnes Pound. And uh, the Totnes Pound is about supporting local uh, businesses through keeping money flowing locally in, in, in the Totnes area. After the Totnes Pound, uh, various other projects have been beginning to set up, including the Re-Economy Project. The Re-Economy Project has developed the local economic blueprint for Totnes, and it's discovered that there is many uh, opportunities for new uh, local businesses to set up, for example, in the food sector. And there's also the incubator, which supports new social environmental enterprises in the Totnes area. And uh, one of the things that I really love is the annual Social Entrepreneurs Forum. This is where projects that need new finance and support get together with local or even national investors and members of the community come to see what they together can offer to support the development of the new local economy in Totnes. One of the things that's probably generated more press and media for Transition Town Totnes than anything else has been the Totnes Pound, which is the local currency scheme we started. And in 2007, uh, I went into a building uh, in the town which used to be a bank. And on the wall they had an 1810 Totnes banknote framed hanging on the wall. And I thought, that's very interesting. What would happen if we printed some more? We printed just 300 as a kind of a, an experiment. And people really liked it. So then we printed some other ones and that was fine. And then we printed these ones. So for, for a few years, we only had a one pound note. This is the new Totnes pound and they have uh, local famous people on them. And we have a 21 pound note. And the woman who's on the 21 pound note is, is the woman who founded the Dartington estate, Dorothy Elmhurst. The idea of this is, can you have a currency which is only has a value uh, in, in Totnes? So if you take it out of Totnes, it has no value. If you think of the economy of Totnes as like a bucket with holes and the money leaving, money pouring out of the town, how can you ensure that the money stays locally? And the local currency does that really beautifully. In terms of thinking about the local economy, you know, can we argue that economic localization is a form of economic development? So last year we did this local economic blueprint. And we did that together with the town council, the district council, the chamber of commerce, the development trust, we had a real coalition of organisations who created that. And the idea of the economic blueprint was, actually, where does all the money go in Totnes? So we know, for example, now that we spend £30 million on food every year. And of that, £22 million is spent through supermarkets. If we could shift 10% of what we spend on food as a community to supporting local food, that's £2 million in our economy every year. That's economic development. And then we also said, well, if you add in energy as well and insulating buildings and things, then actually there's potentially five million pounds that could be in our local economy every year that at the moment just doesn't happen. So we really, really see this as, a for, as economic development, as the, the economic story that defines the future of this town. We also opened the, the Reconomy Centre, which is an incubator for new enterprises. This man is the head of our district council who have given us this space for a very, very low rent. And so many different enterprises are now starting in there. It's a great resource for everybody here. One of my favorite things that we do every year is called the Local Entrepreneurs Forum. So we have a day where we bring together uh, people with ideas for new businesses and potential mentors, uh, people with experience in business, and potential investors, but saying everybody can invest in some way in creating this new economy. One of the social enterprises that I've been involved in has been starting a brewery. And at the first Local Entrepreneurs Forum, uh, we presented the idea of the New Lion Brewery. Uh, and the, another person who, who pitched their business that evening was Adam, who's based here on the Dartington Estate. So now they also take the, the grain that is left over from making beer and they grow mushrooms on that. So uh, we, for this year's Local Entrepreneurs Forum, we made a beer, a stout, a very dark beer that was flavoured with oyster mushrooms. And we called it the circular economy in a glass. 
the Local Entrepreneurs Forum gave us that opportunity to ask and it gave everybody the opportunity to give and so we came together um, and it really spurred us forward because everybody there was really excited and they really really wanted they said yes of course we can support you no problem we'll give you money we'll give you time we'll give you mentoring we'll give you massages whatever you need we've got a room full of uh, very interesting people about 130 people entrepreneurs uh, community folks um, everybody considers themselves an investor, which is kind of exciting. This event has become uh, a fixture in the community, a bit of a focal point around which an entrepreneurial culture is beginning to develop. What I love about the Local Entrepreneur Forum is that it's really where the economy theory comes to life. It feels really exciting to see the number of new faces that are here, and particularly the number of young faces that are here as well. I love the Entrepreneurs Forum. For me, it's one of the highlights of the year. It's really uh, an exciting thing to be at because what you see is what it looks like when a community comes together to support its entrepreneurs, to collectively help to bring a new economy into being. It's always different every year uh, and it's, it's a really thrilling occasion for me. What it brings is just that kind of um, sense of support and um, and kind of solidarity for people who are starting businesses that they can feel that actually they're part of something really special and that it's really important that that's what they're doing and I think it brings a real sense um, to Totnes that we you know that we can start these fantastic businesses and really make a difference. I work for Transition Town Totnes on a project called Foodlink and what I was pitching for today uh, is a project that's come out of that called Grown in Totnes of expanding the range of local food uh, that, that's available beyond uh, the hungry gaps. So the idea is that we work with, with local farmers and encourage them to grow crops that, we, that then can be sold directly for human consumption and we uh, have local processing facilities so that those crops are processed locally and then we sell them locally. I'm Zaf Bowden, um, I'm my project is Dark Valley Timber. It's a new small um, sawmill and timber merchant uh, specialising in you know, the, the most local of timber rather than even just homegrown. It's, it, it's to make the best use of the timber that's already been grown and harvested um, close to Tarnas. My name is Doug King Smith, and I came representing the Hilly Field, which is a which we which is a company regenerating ancient woodland on Dartmoor. So my name is Fraser Durham, I'm Commercial Director of Argan Solutions. We're an energy monitoring business based in Totnes and uh, we basically design, build and install uh, energy monitoring systems for commercial and industrial clients. It's not just about all those different projects, it's about the web, the connections, the relationships that you weave between them because that's what gives a local economy like this its resilience. Let's make a pledge to offer space to grow some oats if windy dark or I'm Martin Foster, editor of Reconnect magazine, and I'd like to pledge a free advertisement. £50 to the crowdfunding. Hi, it's Elliot Smith here from The Living Project, and we would like to pledge you that we're growing some oats. I pledge uh, an investment of somewhere 2000 or upwards, and, um, and I'll, I'll certainly come and work with you. I'd like to invest £2,000 upwards as well, and I'd like to have a conversation with you, Zav, about kind of how much you need and who else is investing. I'd be happy to pledge um, time um, towards mentoring that uh, into making it happen. Transition in Totnes, I think, is one of the most evolved places because what you start to see is how, how transition forms the kind of glue that sticks everything together. So we did a report last year called The New Economy in 20 Enterprises. And we identified from across the UK a number of businesses that you could haven't have anywhere. Social enterprises, community-based businesses. Every town, every city could have its own currency, a community bank, a community energy company, a transport system which is run and managed uh, by the community. But where transition comes in is it's the glue that sticks everything together. And somewhere like Totnes, where we have somebody who sits in the middle as a project manager who connects everything together, makes such a difference. 
In some other places, you get what we call the donut effect, where you start doing transition, lots of stuff starts happening, then you get different working groups start to form food and energy, and then they start to develop their own social enterprises, and then those start to do really well, and everything moves out to the edge, but there's nothing left in the middle. That spark, that transition bit that, that weaves everything together. The idea of transition isn't that transition does everything, that it acts as a kind of, it sort of changes the soil it's a culture process. We started doing transition imagining it was a, an ecological process, an environmental process, an economic process. But now we really see it as being a cultural process. How do you change the culture of a place? And one part of that has been the kind of the focus within Transition Town Totness as well on, on, on what people would call inner transition or how do we support each other to do this? In how, how do we reduce the risk of burnout? How do we support each other? So we now move on to look at how transition works at different scales. At the city level, Transition Bristol is working with the Bristol City Council to implement changes that can happen at a greater scale. And here's Rob again to tell you more. What does transition look like in a city? Totnes is a market town, but how does it scale up to a city? Well, that looks different in different places. So in London now, there are 50 different transition initiatives in different neighbourhoods across the city. Often around the same kind of size of, of Totnes. So how can you take a city and break it down into all its Totnes sized pieces? Because that seems to be a scale where change feels more possible. In Bristol, they started doing, uh, doing Transition Bristol in 2006, 2007, and they tried that idea of starting neighbourhood groups. And some of those groups still work. But actually, they, they found more of a role working with the city council and trying to help the city council to be more innovative. So in 2009, Bristol City Council produced the first peak oil plan for the city. They're the first city to do a plan for how, the, how they will adapt to peak oil. So they started to think at, at the city scale very strategically about what does this look like? And they've been part of Bristol now becoming the European green capital. Their work has been more looking at the look, looking strategically on the city scale and working and giving the almost giving the city council support uh, and uh, and permission to be really experimental and really innovative in terms of looking at transition in Bristol and transition in Totnes. Um, there would be a lots of the lots of the core ingredients that would be the same in terms of how you run a group, how you have a healthy kind of group culture, how you. Um, uh, how you design events using things like open space and World Cafe, how you really kind of talk and, and, and engage people in those questions, those would be the same. Uh, the idea that you would start with food projects, most things would be the same, but there would be certain maybe extra ingredients within a city. I think there are certain things you could do at the city scale that are much harder to do at the scale of a town. So something like the Bristol Pound works so much better because it's got 800,000 people to draw on. But then the beauty of somewhere like Totnes, because it's smaller, is we can make things happen much quicker. So we can start to tell those kind of inspiring stories much quicker uh, at the scale of a town. So I think there's, you know, there, there are pluses and minuses at working at the different scales. This issue of scale is also critical to the Bristol Pound. The Bristol Pound directs the flow of money in the city to increase trade with local independent traders and create community cohesion across the city. I'm very interested in how people in their own places can start to take some control of money and use it to direct flow to places that in, in, increase the uh, well-being of our communities. There are really no positive values in the culture that we're living within, but we have a feeling that they're really almost universal widely shared positive values to do with equality, fairness, collaboration that are very, very important, very commonly shared and we think that we need to bring those back to the fore. So we developed the Bristol Pound concept in 2009 and we developed ideas of how we could get this to a scale where it's really making a, a big impact. The key things for that were firstly the scale of the area that it was operating in, so a city region with approximately half a million people in it, allows enough volume within the system for it to make a real impact and a scale that is credible. Second thing we really wanted to do was 
make sure it works not only with paper notes but also electronically. And the third thing is we wanted to embed it more in the local economy by developing partnerships with key institutions. Firstly, Bristol Credit Union, which is effectively Bristol's own community cooperative bank. It is a genuine local store of money directing it to people in Bristol that really need it the most. And the second institution was uh, Bristol City Council. Throughout history, one of the key things in terms of trust of money is the ability to pay taxes. And so we worked very hard on persuading Bristol City Council to accept some local taxes in Bristol Pounds and got the agreement before we launched that they would that businesses could pay their business rates, which is the local business tax in Bristol Pounds. The mayor gets paid his full salary in Bristol Pounds. Some other employees of the city council get part of their salary in Bristol Pounds. Really what it comes down to is trust. Money at the end of the day is a, a social relation um, and for people to accept it they need to have trust in the system. And we got all those in place, so we now have a local currency that uses paper notes and has been a very important engagement tool. They really feel like they, they belong to Bristol, they, they've come from Bristol. And we have electronic systems so that you can open up a, a Bristol Pound account, you have an online account that you can deposit money into in the normal ways. You can pay, use your online bank account, Bristol Pound account, to make payments online. And we also have electronic payment systems using mobile phones. The total volume in circulation at the moment is approximately 330,000 Bristol Pounds. About 100 is in paper and the rest is in digital accounts. The volume of transactions is a, a bit over 30,000 Bristol Pounds per month. And so from the place where we are now, we're also looking at opportunities of what we can do next and how we can use this tool that we've created to have more positive impact. The first is we're calling the real economy and this is targeted particularly around the poorer areas of Bristol, the more disadvantaged areas of Bristol. One of the criticisms of the Bristol Pound so far is that it doesn't reach those areas. So we want to really help people in those areas as well and make it very inclusive across the city. The real economy is about bringing people together in creating buying groups so that they can use their collective purchasing power. We're also creating pop-up markets so it creates a, a trading place, a hub of trading activity. Now we've got a project starting which is to share this, what we're doing with other areas. As part of that, running as a pilot in Totnes. And there's problems with the scale in Totnes that I was identified as a problem for the Totnes Pound in, when they first launched. We, I, we can overcome some of those problems of scale by, having this dis, by creating this distributed network and running things centrally so it's a lot easier and less costly for them to get this kind of system up and running. We are seeing positive impacts. We know from surveying our members that are using the currency that they're spending more money in the local independent traders in Bristol. We also know from those surveys that people feel more connected to their communities and they feel more pride in their city. It's a big long-term project what we're trying to do and we're in the very, very early days but we're seeing positive impacts. It's very well respected. Apart from the people who use it, we know that there's an awful lot of support within the city for the project. It's, create, it's raised a huge amount of awareness and conversations about what money is, the possibility of having a different type of money. So that again has been very positive, but we've got a long way to go. Another example in Bristol is the Bristol Energy Co-op or Cooperative. In this next case study, we review the formation of the Co-op as an Industrial and Provident Society and its approach to inclusion, as well as some of the solar projects it's been working on. Amelia also talks about the importance of the Bristol Energy Network to share information resources across the city, as well as its role in the creation of a Bristol-wide energy strategy. To start though, Amelia describes the feed-in tariff, which helped kickstart many community energy projects across the UK. So the feed-in tariff is a incentive for renewable energy, for small-scale renewable energy that was first kind of consulted on by the government in 2009 and started in 2010 um, and it's a payment for every unit of electricity generated. So it was something that people who own their own home, who own land or 
who have enough money to invest in the technology could benefit from and get an income over 25 years, whereas people who didn't have that capital in the first place couldn't benefit. And that got me thinking about how that could be made more accessible to more people and I started thinking about cooperatives and whether collectively we could have a system where people could in invest small amounts individually and be able to afford to get some of that benefit of the feed-in tariff. So this is a timeline of how the cooperative has developed over the last four or five years. Um, the idea was first discussed at a Shift Bristol seminar, and that's a course that's been running in Bristol for quite a while. There were people from a number of different sustainability groups who were at that seminar. Um, those people started talking about the feed-in tariff and the implications and thought that a Bristol-wide energy cooperative would be a good way of not having to duplicate the efforts in each neighbourhood, but to have one entity in Bristol and that led to being incorporated as a community benefit society and we managed to by working with Ethical Solar to install um, 20 kilowatts of solar PV on the roof of Hamilton House. So we then launched our first share offer in the spring of 2012 and we were aiming to raise £88,000 and within a month we raised £130,000, so it was much more successful than we planned and that enabled us to do two more installations, one on the roof of this building um, and the other one on the roof of the Eastern Community Centre. As a community benefit society we are guided by our objectives and these are in our legal founding document. So the aim of the Bristol Energy Cooperative is to support the creation of a resilient, robust and organised community and respond equitably to current and future energy challenges. So that means that our mission is about cutting carbon emissions, renewable energy and energy efficiency and doing that in an equitable way. The cooperative has a board of directors, there are six directors and the directors are elected by the members, from the members. Every member has one vote regardless of how much they've invested in the project. And the members are all people who've invested money into the project. This diagram comes from a report by Forum for the Future called Funding Revolution. And it really outlines the model of revolving fund finance that we've been using. The idea is that local shareholders invest in the project that investment is spent on renewable energy projects and then the income from those projects goes back to the local shareholders and also to community benefit activities. The aim of the Bristol Pound is to keep the money circulating in the local economy. So in order to support that, we decided that our members would have the option to buy shares using Bristol Pounds and to receive their interest payments in Bristol Pounds. The other thing that we've done in terms of inclusion and also dealing with money is to work with the Bristol Credit Union to try and make the shares more accessible to more people. Bristol has a lot of different people doing things about community energy. The Bristol Energy Network was started as a way of avoiding each of those groups having to reinvent the wheel and make materials for themselves independently. Over the past couple of years, the Bristol Energy Network has been coordinating the development of a community strategy for energy. Um, and that's what that blue circle is, is the kind of headline output of that strategy, which has five different themes. These are community resilience and fuel poverty, understanding energy and behaviour, energy efficiency and low carbon technology, renewable energy generation and local economic development. There is a very strong sense of community among the members of the Bristol Energy Network. People have got to know each other, you see the same faces each time and there's a real sense that we're working together to try and transform things in Bristol and that feels really inspiring. So, so far we've been looking at what transition looks like at the town level and we looked at various projects. 
we just looked at what transition looks like at the city level, but what I found really exciting is how transition is now beginning to influence national policy making. And this is a bottom-up movement. It all starts with local initiatives in your local community, which are joining together to begin to create change at the national level. And this is totally different, a, a different way of operating than how community strategies normally operate, which are uh, the people in offices, government offices, develop the community strategy and then it's evolved downwards. This is a totally bottom-up strategy and it means it's got real power and energy behind it because people are being empowered and are passionate about these projects. People might say, well, transition is all very well, it's a nice idea, but it's not going to affect government thinking, government policy. Well, actually, uh, earlier this year, the government here produced the community energy strategy. There are so many communities now, some transition communities, some not transition communities, who are starting their own energy companies. That The government had to create some kind of a strategy to, to keep up. So Transition Network was involved in helping to write the strategy. Many of the case studies in there are transition examples. And so now it's the first example of what policy making designed to support transition looks like. So we've just heard Rob talk about the community energy strategy from the UK government. And there's also been a government policy on PV solar, which encourages and supports local communities to start their own energy projects, and in particular on the top of residential buildings. But transition is not just about affecting policy in the area of energy. More recently, the UK Parliament published a note on alternative currencies looking at several local currencies, including the Totnes Pound and the Bristol Pound, as well as the digital currency Bitcom. The first national document we've seen, however, was from the Bank of England. Here is Rob again to tell you more about how the Bristol Pound influenced the formation of this document, as well as the importance of transition to remain non-party political. The Bristol Pound was the first one that was big enough and they got lots of publicity, they got lots of uh, media coverage. And one day they got a call from the Bank of England who said, could you uh, come to London and uh, have a conversation with us? So they went up and they spent three hours with the Bank of England being quizzed and it, like an exam. What are you doing? How does this? What? And actually the Bank of England about six months ago published uh, a document which is their position on local currencies. The thing that I love about the Bristol Pound is that if somebody wants to close down the Bristol Pound, they don't take on Transition Bristol, they take on the City Council. One of the powers of Transition, I think, is, is that it is not party political. So it has no allegiance in terms of different political parties. So it's not a left-wing thing, a right-wing thing, uh, anti-capitalist, pro-capitalist, whatever. Transition works kind of underneath the surface, underneath the radar. And it's only able to do that because it's not seen as being political. So something like the economic blueprint that we created in Totnes with the town council and the district council and the chamber of commerce, we could only do that because we are seen as being uh, not political in that way. And I think similarly, if, uh, you know, I'm sure there are people who are involved in transition who go to McDonald's. Uh, I'm sure there are people involved, probably not very many, but I'm sure there are some. And there are people who are involved in transition who vote for all different political parties. And, and so actually we try to remain very open so we don't have a big long list of things that we don't like. You know, we are, our focus is on how do we make this economy more resilient? How do we have a, a healthier, uh, better connected culture uh, in this town? With transition towns now being in over a thousand places across the globe, certain lessons have been learnt during the formation of these, these first initiatives. Rob now talks about some of the reasons why transition towns fail, how training is used to try and tackle these challenges up front, and the importance of celebration in keeping the momentum going. Sometimes transition groups fail because they all argue with each other. Uh, sometimes transition groups fail because the scale of what they take on is too big. Some fail because life kind of takes over, I suppose. They just burn out or run out of energy and it just, they don't manage to keep it moving forward. So the, the training that we do, the two-day transition launch training, which is the training to get people started, is very much about those things. How do we, you know, how do you 
avoid conflict in your group? How do you look at sustaining the momentum? How do you get the right structures in place to enable it to move forward? And our experience is that, that the initiatives that, that do the training have a much, much higher uh, chance, of, chance of success. The thing that I often experience is I go to visit a transition group and they say, well, we don't feel like we've done very much and uh, you know, we, feel, we feel like we're running, we've run out of energy a little bit because we don't really feel we've done very much. You know? And you say, and, and I say, so, so tell me what you've done. Tell me about the last three or four years. What have you done? Well, we did this and we did that and we did that and we did that and we did this and we did that and we did that really great thing over there and we did this. And we, and they go on they're like 20 minutes about we did this and we did that. And I say, like, well, have you, ever, have you ever as a group stopped to celebrate all this fantastic stuff you've done? No. You know, and the culture is so often we just keep going. We do one thing and then we do the next thing and then we do the next thing. And, we do, and you never stop to, to pat everybody on the back and say, fantastic, well done, that's brilliant. I think one of the fascinating things about how the Transition Town movement has evolved it started off firstly as a detox for the global north, so how are we going to move beyond uh, our addiction to uh, fossil fuels and how are we going to adapt to climate change. But now it's been taken on by many countries in the global south who are not, the issues for them are not so much about climate change and peak oil, but it's more about issues around poverty and, and women's empowerment. So whether it's the detox in the global north or the evolution of an alternative transition development path in the global south. Transition is now popping up in, across all cultures and all geographies all over the world. So Transition Network, which is based here in Totnes, we have about 12 people now that work for Transition Network. There are transition initiatives, I think, in about 50 countries. So we have now 20, 20 countries that have a national transition organisation. Transition US, Transition Italy, Transition Sweden or whatever. So there is a network of those organisations. We have about 140 transition trainers around the world who run training courses. The process of becoming a transition initiative, a formal and official transition group, is normally people just send us an email and we have a few quick questions. But in, in lots of places, people's relationship is more with the transition initiatives around them or with a national organisation than with us. So in Japan, for example, there are maybe, we have maybe four Japanese transition initiatives registered with us on our website, but there are about 40. In Sweden, I think we have seven Swedish initiatives registered with us, and there are 171 on the Swedish website. So it's kind of, it's, it's difficult. People, people's relationship tends to be with what's closest to them rather than with us. So the figures that we have are, are fairly low. The model has always been very self-organising, you know, take it, run with it, make it happen. So in Brazil, there's lots of transition happening all across Brazil, but, but we didn't think, we must now, now we must, it's not like a Coca-Cola franchise, you know, we didn't say now, now we must take Brazil. Brazil, just people got excited and decided they were going to do transition. When we started transition, our idea was that what we were creating was a, a detox for the West, for the global North. And in the contraction and convergence climate model where the, the West is here and it needs to come down to here and the developing world needs to come up to here to a point where everybody can carry on on a, on a sustainable kind of level, transition was about this bit. How do we bring, get from there to there in such a way that it feels like we've progressed and moved forward rather than gone back to living in the caves again? You know. But what's been really interesting as a self-organizing model is to see transition emerging in Brazil, in India, in South Africa, uh, in, in places. So in Brazil, um, there are, there's some really good transition happening in favelas, uh, in Sao Paulo, for example. There's a place called Brasilândia, which is the first transition initiative in a favela. And uh, there, they don't talk about peak oil and climate change. They talk about transition as being about social justice, uh, uh, empowerment for women, uh, ending violence in society. They've developed ways to teach transition to people who can't read. Uh, and a lot of their work is around social enterprise. So there's lots of new social enterprises that have started in, in, uh, in um, Brasilândia. And um, 
They are brilliant. They are really interesting projects. There's a place in South Africa called Grayton, which is a town uh, which was built as a kind of um, to move a lot of the black community out to a place sort of away from everybody else. And transition, the woman who was doing transition there, she said transition is the best um, community development tool I've ever come across. And they're using it there to do work around uh, waste and recycling and food and all kinds of different things there. I think in terms of the developing world, I mean, there is a very good thing called Buen Vivir, which is a sort of started in South America, which is about saying actually what the developing world needs is alternatives to development rather than a sort of greener form of development. It's a different approach to development, which they're modeling now, which is about, which starts with the small farmers, it starts with the communities, uh, like, like the Zapatistas, you know, mobilizing to say no to things, but also telling a story about what people want instead. And that's a very powerful kind of growing movement. So we would see transition as kind of sitting alongside that. It's really interesting. I didn't expect that at all. You know, I thought we were developing something that would only really have traction in the, in the global north. So in this movement we started off looking at what transition looks like at the town level. We looked at various projects, we looked at food projects and energy projects and finance projects. And then we looked at what transition looks like at the city level and how Transition Bristol is working with Bristol City Council. We then looked at how uh, transition is beginning to affect national policy and its impact on energy policies and alternative currencies for example and also the international aspects of, of transition and how regional and national hubs are springing up all over the world and how a different development path is evolving. We, we thought at first it was about a detox, us in, in the West um, getting over our addiction to fossil fuels and learning to live or adapt to climate change. But now we've realized that the transition model can be used as a, an alternative path for development in the global south. I hope you find it inspiring and I hope you will look at the resources that are available at the end of uh, this movie and look at the Transition Network site, look at Schumacher College site, perhaps start up a transition initiative in your area or if you're lucky there will already be one for you to join, so good luck. say that uh, the main historical project is uh, modernization and industrialization. So by 1970 I was uh, farming about 200 hectares. The education for the children and, and young people would take place actually on the land. Liangshu means uh, has a metaphor of uh, rural reconstruction in China. It is a uh, new bus on the old trees. The farm is used essentially to, they have some fields for pasture, but everything else is wheat and maize. Lovely woodland. Thank <laughs> you.